19th of March 2013. Suspicions. Book to check up with Dr. Ralph Hughes, my GP. Morning, Nigel. How are you? I've known Ralph for a few years now. He's also a neighbour in Lawshall Green. He's tall, at least six foot three, lanky, with big ears, a very pointy nose, and he listens well. It's hard to be completely relaxed with him because of the nature of the examination that's about to be performed. I also notice it's a bit of a silly question to ask, but how else would he open the conversation? How are you? Well, I've noticed that there is blood in my stools and I wondered if you should take a look. Okay, tell me a little more. How long has this been going on? Do you have any stomach pains, cramps, anything else? He puts on the glove and finds some lubricating jelly and has a good old look and poke around. Hmm. Doesn't look too serious to me at this moment and your stomach feels fine. But I suggest you monitor it closely and if it persists, we'll refer you on. 25th of October, 2013, double check. Visit to the GP, but this time Ralph is on holiday, so I have to see another doctor. I decided this blood in my stools and a slight pain when crapping has to be attended to, especially as we've now committed to going to India. I arrive at surgery on time for a mid-morning appointment and am called in by a rather squat and dowdy looking woman in her mid-forties. How can I help you? Is her opening greeting, a bit more efficient than Ralph's. I tell her about the blood and the slight pain and she offers to carry out an examination. As gently as she can, she inserts a finger up my bum and rootles around a bit. Hmm. Well, I think this might be more than hemorrhoids. So I'll refer you to West Suffolk Hospital and let's see what they say. It doesn't look too serious. I tell her I'm off to India in a few weeks for two months. Oh well, hopefully you'll be seen before then. I leave a little reassured that it's not too serious and happy to wait for the specialist to see me, possibly before I go off on my travels. But the appointment never arrives. Sunday the 6th of April. A very dear and close friend rings to say he's been diagnosed with motor neuron disease, just as we stepped in the door from another dear friend's funeral where Rick read the eulogy. Monday the 7th of April, 1.15pm. BMI private appointment with specialist to look at my piles. Delayed from October 2013 due to administrative confusions and my two months sojourn working in India. He pokes around my anus and rectum and unlike possible public perception, this gay man does not enjoy fingers or receptacles up my bum. He tells me it's likely to be something more serious possibly a malignant growth. I may need chemo and radiotherapy. He's direct, serious and compassionate. We compare diaries and set a date, Wednesday the 9th of April in two days time for minor op biopsy under general anaesthetic at the end of a full and busy day of surgery. He will squeeze me in. He suggests CT and MRI scans too for belt and braces. They are fixed for tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday. Home again to help Rick with his final draft of his new play. We want to keep focused on creativity. Wednesday the 9th of April. I have a coaching session in London as well as an important new client meeting. So Wednesday is suddenly full. I get to bury NHS hospital for about 8.30 a.m. I have my CT scan, use the can eat and drink one hour window before surgery rule as I drive from Bury to Colchester. I catch the train to London, 
complete one hour coaching session, scoot to the very successful client meeting, scoot back to Liverpool Street Station, arrive Colchester, drive back to Bury BMI, private hospital in time to be admitted, settled and operated on at 5.30 in the afternoon. I made a deal with the anaesthetist that I'd be able to walk out and go home around 7.30. Neil, my surgeon, appears, proudly shows me my large private room and we discuss the forthcoming procedure. We agree he'll not do anything too drastic. I walk to the small operating theatre, lie on the bed, have my anaesthetic, and sleep descends. I wake up at 6.35 as promised, back in my private room, eat my pre-ordered sandwich, yoghurt, fruit and tea. I rest for one hour. Nurse arrives to check me out and I'm walking around the room, having had a pee, one of the free to discharge stipulations. Agree with anaesthetist and surgeon that I am fit to leave. Staff nurse accompanies me up to the exit gate, just in case, where Rick picks me up at 8.20 and home we go by 8.45. Phew, sadly no time to review his latest scene dynamic. Thursday, April the 10th. Resting at home, the same friend who rang to give motor neuron diagnosis rings again to say his mum-in-law, whom we are close to, has days to live. Rick and I have plenty of time to review his scene and we're confident that we can have an Easter break having reached half time. Friday the 11th of April. I keep my 11 a.m. haircut appointment but struggle to sit in the chair and keep a brave face blaming a dicky back. My sister-in-law Angela arrives the weekend and keep up the dicky back scenario so not to alarm her. We have a restful weekend, but I have two things on my mind. The accumulating evidence now being processed in the system will decide my short-term future course of action. And the body pain of stitches up my bum causing me acute pain when I crap. Monday the 14th of April. I honoured my additional and long-planned hygienist and dental appointments Monday morning conducted the phone coaching client call and several client director's calls, travelled to London, reached the train toilet just in time, had my two-hour promotion coaching session, hopped on the tube, DLR, flight, Geneva, cab, and to hotel, all without incident. Ordered room service, ate it gently, opened all the windows for cooler air so I could sleep. Tuesday the 15th of April, up at 5.30, ate the biggest bowl of porridge ever, delicious. Fantastic full day follow-up session with CEO and HR director of a new company. I was audacious and warned them I had a tummy upset and may have to leave the room at a moment's notice. The HR director said, don't worry, we don't want you to shit your pants. So after lunch, we repaired to the conference room and both surprised themselves and surpassed themselves in their new unlocked passion and communication. Back in the cab. Flight, DLR, tube, train to Colchester, 40 minute drive. Yup, I was triumphant. Wednesday the 16th of April, back at home. The big wait. Surgeon said he would call. No call. After email prompt to him, he promised to phone me with results after lunchtime meeting. No email or message from my surgeon. When may I hear from you, please? I mail him around 15.30. As soon as I get home, he replies at 18.15. 7 p.m. he rings with the news. Nigel. Squamous cell carcinoma. We will need to do chemo radio. Hmm. I arranged to see him at the end of day, Thursday, 6 p.m. Wait with a book. Start eating supper. 
Phone rings. Mum died this afternoon. Thursday the 16th of April. Rick and I visit surgeon, get given the lowdown. Make a forward plan for after Easter. I call a cancer survivor good friend, ask for her support in my forward journey. She is just who and what I need, says all the right things without any panic. Rick completes his final review of part one and we can relax and take stock of everything. Good Friday, 17th of April. We drive a dismal grey route to Snape for a Mozart concert. We arrive both deplete and desperate and guzzle a cream tea. Walk along a cold and windswept estuary. Have supper crammed in at small tables and listen to an appalling concert. The conductor not only manages to suppress three beautiful Mozart pieces, but also beats the Britain Pears young orchestra into submission and totally squashed a talented mezzo-soprano. Arrive home, start to eat. Phone rings. Rick's sister. I know you don't like this kind of news, but John died. His funeral is on Wednesday. I recall a poem from The Moon Appears When the Water Is Still by Ian McCrory. Life is like bailing a boat with a hole in it. No matter how fast we work, no matter how large our pail, no matter how many friends help us, water continues to pour in. But what if we accept the fact that our boat has a hole in it and sooner or later it will sink? We continue to bail without the hope of stemming the water, but because bailing is the stuff of life. Now, freed of the craving to solve the tragedy of our existence, we can turn our eyes to the heavens above and bask in the wonder and joy of the futility of it all. Don't worry, things will get worse. <laughs>